All right. Hello, Dana. <laughs> Hi, David. We're using one of the new features of the new iOS 15.1. Isn't this awesome? You can just record a call and it says to the person, this call may be recorded for quality assurance. <laughs> Love so that. You, you were saying something very interesting. This is, um, we're fulfilling our dream of just hitting record on our awesome conversation. So you're saying, so what you're saying is, is that um, a woman's place actually is the kitchen. That's it's like when you put it like that, it sounds very awkward. But let me explain why. <laughs> I don't actually it mean sense. it like that. That's just a funny way to put it. Well, yes. Let me explain why being in the kitchen is a wonderful place. And for this started a woman. because Tim Pool said that Kamala Harris would make a good cooking show if she's not president. But so go, go, go ahead. Well, yeah, she seems to really love cooking a lot, much more than she loves, uh, you know, doing, doing a, I'm just going to say it, being president's a man's job, you oh, know, okay. and just going to say it. Uh, Hillary I, I Clinton, don't necessarily Hillary... feel that way. I think Tulsi Gabbard would make an excellent president. That's true. That's true. But then again, Tulsi Gabbard, she, she is, um, she's. You know what? I have to say, actually, Tulsi Gabbard is very feminine while being a strong, assert uh, assertive, uh, feminine leader. She's she's a real exception, Tulsi Gabbard. Okay. Well, sure. She's pretty great. And so she she might even be Trump's secretary of state if Trump wins. But you oh were God, saying you react oh. to the whole Kamala's kitchen idea by saying, you know what? Women feel super comfortable in the kitchen when they're cooking. That was your reaction. Yes, and my whole thing about that, there's a, there's a biological reason for that. And the reason for that is because a woman, she needs to feel safe. Mm -hmm. she, she wants to feel safe. She wants to feel like she's fed. She wants to, she biologically, it's like the, men and women are so different. A woman and, and by the way, feel, Dana and I have designed kitchens for both woman people and men people that we think they love. But and that's we love yes. doing that. So Dana and I think about kitchens often. But go ahead, talk about the, the love, meaning of I the love kitchen. Design, yes, we love design: kitchens, bathrooms, bedrooms, closets, all right. of it. So stay focused. But, talk about talk about the kitchen feeling. So so um so a woman, uh, and I don't mean that that a woman shouldn't have other occupations, but let's be real: a woman will feel most enthusiastic. A woman who a woman who feels like you know most in her uh, feminine self will will feel like a sense of giddiness when she's in the kitchen. Even even women who don't like to cook will feel a sense of giddiness in the kitchen, That's like when they open a bag of when they open a bag of chips or they're like having a little snack or they're going to get their ice cream. It's like ooh, you know, they get all excited. Where okay. it's like men men don't get excited like that in the kitchen. Men don't care men, about kitchens. Men care about no. the things they produce in the kitchens. And men care about how the kitchens, and I, t I talk about this as a man who cooks and bakes, a guy who makes Chicago pizza, or a guy who makes, uh, what do you call it, uh, Kaiser Schnallen, a guy who makes salad gratin, a guy who makes uh, tiramisu. So the, yes. the, the way that I approach a kitchen from those days, you could say a masculine point of view, is that it is a workflow. It is, it, it is, it is a place for a workflow to happen. For, for delicious, yummy things to come from what you do with your hands. Yes, yes. And the thing is, is that, yes, guys get excited about creating stuff in the kitchen, whereas women get excited about um, having something that feeds them and feeds other people. Yes. So, you know, so it's like a woman or, or something tasty, like a woman gets excited about having something tasty nearby. And so, you know, whereas a man, he gets excited watching sports, he gets excited, you know, uh, watching a, like uh, having some kind of. Like, These are all outcome and objective oriented activities, which is one of the average general distinctions between men and women, that men focus on things and women focus on people is a popular way to say it. And you can say exactly. that, that, that men focus on outcomes, whereas women focus on interpersonal connection. And guess what? We can't have a civilization unless there are people who do both. 
so it works. Yes, right? exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and so so there are women who very much um, don't like cooking. They don't like being in the kitchen. They don't like any of that. And and it works when they have a, a guy who either loves to to fill in that spot or or they have a maid who who does it. But I mean, you get all kinds of complications when one partner when both partners totally dislike to, to cook and, and you can't really afford uh, to do otherwise. And I think that's a little bit of, um, that's a little bit of a design solution is that the, the factory kitchen that came out of the 1920s that came from uh, Bruno Taut and uh, Margaret, when Margaret Schutterlachowski, um, maybe, but there, there was a, um, there was a woman who was an architect and or a furniture designer or something. And then Bruno Taut was an architect in Germany. Um, they, they, they helped develop what in Europe influenced this, this kind of small, as small as possible, what we call the factory kitchen. Um, and someone like Frank Lloyd Wright was completely opposed to all of that. He, he said that the, furthermore, he thought there should be fireplaces everywhere which people enjoy, he was fond of saying, the hearth is the heart of the home. And my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, had an old farmhouse house, which wasn't a farmhouse when they were in it, but it had a kitchen fireplace that they actually used. Um, Wait, a kitchen fireplace? Yeah, that they actually used for stuff. And they actually helped keep the house warm with it. Oh, that's lovely. Did they make? Could they make food in it or something, or is it just? Uh, very rarely. It would have been something kind of exotic and fancy if they cooked over a fire. But but you can do that, and you can make it. You can make it in such a way so that it's easier to cook. And just think, just think about the kind of pizza you can make if you have a fireplace, right? And you do yeah. It the right way. Love or a big pot of soup. Yeah, a big mm-hmm. pot. Of so. Soup. <laughs> um, people have been, people have kind of been taught and trained to not, this is part of the learned helplessness thing that's such a thing lately. People have been taught and trained by our culture generally and somewhat the economy and somewhat social expectations to not cook for themselves or that it's hard. That's yeah, weird. Right? But you can, you can do it and you can have fun. And there are things that are actually quite good, like steak, that's super easy to make. But yeah, that's another, that's another topic. Yeah, it, it it really is so odd that uh, people today they think that it, it costs so much money to buy groceries and to cook at home, and then always saves you money to go to cook McDonald's. at home. It always saves you money when you cook at home when you do it the right way. <laughs> what you're doing is you're trading time for money, and uh, you spend a little bit more time, but you save a bunch of money. And uh, I think this is one of the things that COVID brought to the front is that people wouldn't go to a restaurant. So they were like, oh yeah, cooking at home is horrible. So. Ooh, well, you know I love, interesting. Uh, I'm walking by what? someone that left a big screen TV, uh, an old Sony big screen TV. That's the type that has a diffuser lens that you can melt rocks with. So... Is it a good TV? Like, what are you passing? Well, it's probably by a right broken now? TV. But if I take it apart, if I take it apart, we can melt rocks. We can melt. We can get liquid granite. Uh, we don't want to do that. <laughs> we don't want to get liquid granite and liquid limestone. You don't. You don't want to make architectural details for people out of liquid granite. No, <laughs> we'll hire a professional to do the that. The company's co-founder, uh, Brian. Brian always wanted to melt rocks with a diffuser. He'd be all over that. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, but he also liked, you know, putting up well, it, fires for other things. Yes, he liked he, burning he, he, he likes he liked making his Yes, he, he likes putting clay in not kiln fires to see what happened and kind of just took up yeah. a lot of time and we made a lot of burnt stuff. Um yeah, no and we're not we're not about to light houses on fire and start fires with well, who with, said anything about that? No, we're definitely no, nobody's doing that. So back to the whole kitchen thing. Our discussion belongs in the kitchen, Dana. <laughs> so Well, you know, it's like I I love I okay, by the way, kitchen design is so important. It is. And we can make the kitchen so that people feel more comfortable cooking. Well, one thing that um, that makes me incredibly uncomfortable in a kitchen is a long, narrow kitchen. That needs to stop. 
Like, right. I, when did that start happening? Because the fifties is... mostly. I that was that that's is... the factory. That's the factory kitchen. They're thinking of it like an assembly line. That's the factory kitchen. That is the most horrible design for a kitchen I've ever experienced. The kitchen needs to be either an open space as part of like the living room, or it needs to be in a square. Yeah, squarish. Like, next mm -hmm. to the dining room, or you know, kitchen nook, or something like. Those corners, corners are incredibly useful when you're cooking. You stand in one place and you reach around you. Yeah. Yeah, and just you know, like having having a kitchen where, you know, there's stuff in front of you, and then or stuff to the side. Or, or stuff in back it's like it's not this like thing where you're sandwiched in between a long strip and and a wall or like a long strip and then some cabinets behind you it's like i despise that so much because number one it cuts out so much light opportunity and two it um it yeah that's something from pattern language one of the great rules of thumb from pattern language is try at least to have light from two sides of each room natural light from two sides of each room that way you don't feel like you're trapped in a tunnel yeah and and you can't do that in a long narrow kitchen correct you can't well you, it, you not can't. not as well not as well you can but not as well well, n not really, not at all, because I mean, maybe one side of the kitchen is going to have a small little window, but then and then it you're takes away from your cabinets. Get... Well, yeah, but also you're not going to get that cross lighting because right. you're not going to get that cross lighting. Right. But for instance, like my my kitchen right now, it's a it's a small kitchen. It's not super small, but it's small, and there's a nice big beautiful window. But the thing is, is that I can open the door to my kitchen and now it's being illuminated by the by other windows in my apartment because because it's a square it allows for more light to come into it. Yeah. And then circulation of course if I have people over it's not awkward to be shifting around like you're you know in an assembly line like you know. One of the interesting things about Chris, uh, when I lived with uh, Chris and Maggie Alexander for a few months, Christopher Alexander, the guy who does the, the pattern language type thing here, setting up that school in Italy, uh, I really sharpened and deepened my cooking skills simply because they lived in a 500-year-old kitchen. Well, a 500-year-old house that had a beautiful Elizabethan-era, well-designed farmhouse kitchen. And it was just so well-tuned and well-adjusted to human cooking. And they had one of those, uh, I forget what you call it, but it's one of those always on British gas stoves that are kind of a, just a joy to work with. Um, and the gas stove also heated the house. It was one of those things. Um, and yeah, and, and it was interesting because you could see where part of the kitchen was blocked off from the back because they had something where you could toss out your leftover vegetables to a compost pile right out the side of the kitchen and or you could have a horse stick its head through to the kitchen. Wouldn't that be fun, Dana, to have a horse stick its head through your kitchen? Oh my gosh, that's like my dream. <laughs> my dream, what, my dream. That's what people oh. used to have. My dream is to have a house with a little cottage in the back where i could have like chickens and and horses like an al or maybe like an alpaca or two that's like my dream my dream is to have horses and chickens and you could feed oh the God. alpacas you could feed the alpacas treats when they come to this special window like that you open up a french yes. window a double a double wide french window that double swings you open that up yes and like, make noises and the alpacas come and we give them treats Yes, and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, we could totally buy a house, like a big piece of land here in a little house and make that happen, and then it's only maybe like a four-hour train ride to, to get to, you know, to Paris versus, you know, if you lived in middle America or something, that's like, you, you can't do that. Well, a four-hour train ride on the TGV, that pretty much gets you three quarters of the way across France. Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. So it's yeah. like, you know, you could find an affordable lot of land somewhere in France and do that. But in in, in LA, it's like if you want to have a successful business and make money in your business, you you have to live. Well, you know, if you want to have a successful business that makes money in LA, you do what we did for two years and what we're still doing because that is what we're doing. 
Well, yeah, and that's but why I mean, we're maintaining. That is why we're maintaining a business presence in Los Angeles County because it is a profitable exactly. business and continuing exactly. forward. Have, have, having both is is ideal, and that's right. you know maybe maybe one day if if we could ever afford it to get like a little uh, place in Hidden Valley. Hidden Valley is right. gorgeous. It's something that is very possible because that kind of countryside plus city is very good for this geography around here. Yes, definitely. And so, anyways, um, oh my gosh, I, I didn't understand the full, I didn't understand the full context of what happened to Peanut until you told me. And then I, you want to go I on about Peanut now? You okay? So we're shifting gears. We're not talking about kitchens anymore, ladies and gentlemen. We are talking about Peanut the squirrel and Fred the raccoon. We cannot forget Fred. Yeah, I can't forget uh, Shred the Raccoon, and oh my gosh, yeah, well, because, you know, we, we got on to talking about uh, chickens and horses and everything, and that's just like a Peanuts, Peanuts Ranch, and it it just breaks my heart to know that that this happened, and um, I, it's just, it's just so wild, it's just so wild what's happening right now with the United States, how they're allowing so much crime to happen with with real situations and then yet they hired this like crazy squad to go and in, interrogate these people these these american citizens like him and his and his wife okay yeah. and and um and and yet there's so much drugs and and horrible things and you know trafficking and all this happening in the united states and open borders and like you know murder murders happening and then yet you know, rape and murder and everything, and yet this guy, he has a squirrel. <laughs> they come after his squirrel, like, what the hell? Yes, it didn't make much sense. Something that it someone make... pointed out is that this is one thing. This doesn't necessarily mean the United States is getting worse. In some ways, you could argue that it is, but what it definitely means is that the problems that are already here are becoming more visible. So, with all of this new media, with all of the social media, we shouldn't get blackpilled about it, as they say. We can say, oh, look, we're seeing the problems now, and we get to choose how we solve them, and we get to choose which ones we do solve. And I think that's very important. Well, one thing is, you know, I very much dislike, the, I, I very much am against this whole concept, I, we're like switching again, to this whole idea of um, pets and not allowing a, a hu not allowing for people to have like uh wild pets like a squirrel and it's like think about this okay so you're saying you're saying that if you're super nice to a squirrel and he becomes your best friend and then he starts coming into your house then then the the government's going to come and kill them because now you've just made friends with a wild animal like are you are we not allowed well, friends. the Did government, the, the other thing, I posted, I posted a picture of Bob Ross with a squirrel, because Bob Ross would have squirrels on his show, because he worked with him oh in the rescue place, right. and he would have, he would have little baby squirrels stay with him, he would be, Bob Ross would be a squirrel foster dad, because they didn't have much space at the squirrel rescue place, and he would have rescue raccoons, he would have rescue squirrels, and I just posted that picture of Bob Ross and said something like, that was a different world, you know, <laughs> no one, no one was breaking into bob ross's house were they no and i don't think anybody would dare because he's freaking bob ross like, well, like he, who, he was, is, who is the conscious to do that he was mostly famous after he died he became much more famous later on mm. he was about as famous as a local weatherman and um or the a tv news anchor he was kind of about that famous when he was having his show in the 80s but it just doesn't make sense like why you couldn't take a squirrel as a pet because it's like you can have a rat as a pet it doesn't make sense why you can't have a squirrel as a pet oh yeah those, and those are all new york state law things that actually people are changing it just doesn't make sense because you know if if these animals are you know it just doesn't make sense if you can prove that you're giving a nice life to an animal why would you why would you prevent it from 
being inside your house and people argue oh the wild life is supposed to be wild it's like oh okay so so basically uh you know if a homeless person is is you know needs a place to live like oh no don't don't interrupt them don't don't adopt those stray cats that's a wild cat yeah yeah don't don't adopt don't don't adopt that child that child needs to learn their own place in this world there is a good distinction raccoons raccoons make terrible pets why because they're smart they're smarter than a kitten, and they have hands that can grab things. So that's okay, why well, so that's, this was this was this was a rescue place. This was specifically a rescue place, and that's why they had Fred the raccoon. Is they were specifically a rescue place. So, but, yeah, but well, raccoons, well, raccoons do not make good pets. Well, well, look it. Either do chil- either do children, and we go ad- adopt them. Of course, children are get- not pets. We can, Dana. Children speak language. It makes that that, that makes I- all the difference. I know, yes, but, children, but look, a child's going to give pets. you more problems. A child's going to give you more problems. They got, they get into, um, the, they they get into booze. They they go partying. They, you know, not saying that, not saying that adopting a child is bad. I'm saying we should adopt children, you know. But I'm saying that, come on, we should. There, why deprive the out? If if being a human is so wonderful, the wonderful gift that we've been given, why would we deprive wildlife of sharing that beauty? with us if we have hands that we're able to give a gift to a friend why couldn't we give that gift to animals and say well, you know what you weren't animals with hands. animals and people get hurt sometimes there that's why the laws exist like this there was the famous or infamous story of the woman who had a chimpanzee that ripped her face off this well is, yeah but that's different that's yes. different and i imagine a world i imagine a world you know, back to the whole idea of a, of a kitchen. I imagine a world where where we can feed animals just like we feed ourselves. Like I envision a world where we take care of the natural world and not just expect it to defend for itself in this cruel life. Well, in some I, ways, in some ways, this is always how humans have behaved. Humans in Australia, humans in Africa, humans in the Amazon. The Amazon is the descendant of trees that were gardened by humans, like orchards. The wow. whole Amazon is highly, highly, highly influenced by human orchards. This is some of the stuff that Dan Hancock's been covering with his latest, the latest research that he's journalizing in his uh, America Before series, season two. Keanu Reeves is in it, and everybody's like, yeah. Well, it's like, you know, imagine imagine a world where we do have more zoos, and, and there's a zoo in every, I imagine a world where we have a zoo in every village. Every village has like its own well, separate we used zoo. To, we used to have that pretty close. We used to have pretty close to that. A guy was telling me about how in Beverly Hills there used to be a little pony farm, even in the late seventies. Yeah, and imagine how cool there this used to could be the be. ostrich. There used to be the ostrich farm in South Pasadena. Yes, yes, and then all these human or the animal rights activists or whatever they basically deprived these animals of getting fed. They, and tried now, to, they tried to do that in New York, too. They tried to shut down the Central Park horses, which I thought was cruel and stupid. That's, a, it's, that's it's not a bad cool life for a horse. It's nice, it's nice to be a Central Park horse. You get to talk you know, to imagine parents this. and little kids. Im- imagine this. Imagine, imagine they say, oh, uh, it's evil to employ humans. Uh, you should let humans be homeless on the street <laughs> instead of employ them. Well, How that's kind of a mistake. Be- that's kind of the mistake that was made for the past 10 years is that it's evil to enforce vagrancy laws with people on the street yes that's that's actually the attitude that was taken sadly and now it's being corrected now it's being now it's being changed well it's like not even just like you know how dare you not allow homeless people on the street but like how dare you even employ a person how dare you how dare you pay a person or give them food to work that that person should be picking berries in the forest well, okay. So you would, you want to have food be the minimum wage? No, I'm what I'm no. What I'm saying is, like, how is that? Why is it cruel to have a zoo where the animals are working to perform entertainment or or to just be part of part I'm of just, the 
I'm just imagining if one of those fat groundhogs in a zoo could talk and be like, what are you looking at? I'm working. I'm working. <laughs> you know, you know what's amazing? Like I, I'm seeing all these videos of like mice that can navigate with like little joysticks and they're like navigating to get little pieces of cheese with a joystick. That's cool. They're driving a little car. Yeah, they're driving little cars and I'm like, oh my god, can you imagine if we had if we if we employed animals (laughs) to work and had like mice that were like getting paid in cheese and they're like were running conveyor belts? That was that was probably tried in the nineteen twenties. I don't know if you know, it's like it's like look at the Flintstones. Why? Can, how come we love the Flintstones and we see them doing things with with dinosaurs and everything? And then here we are being stupider than the Flintstones. Well, that's the Flintstones. That, that's a mystery. That's a mystery. Well, I think that we should wrap it up. Is there anything that you want to say before we finish our wonderful rambly talk? Yeah. Well, just imagine. Imagine we had a zoo in every village, and each one of those zoos had a tunnel or some type of crosswalk that all the animals yeah. could go and travel to every zoo they wanted all around the whole country they can go to any zoo that they wanted at dana any you time. could you could make this as a new pattern language entry you could call it zoo network yes a network of zoos where where yes. wildlife has its own inhabited space separate Dana, from humans within Dana, Dana has within Dana that. has discovered a new pattern. I think this would be very cool. Isn't that great? We start about kitchens and then we end up talking about discovery the zoo network. Yes, zoo okay. network like like imagine imagine you know you have the urban fabric of humans then you have the urban with, fabric. Yes, interlaced with parks and pathways for animals. And huh, and then you have, and they're working on things like that. They're working on stuff like that already. And then also you have another fabric, which is of cars. So you have cars, mm-hmm. and then you have humans. You yeah. have, and then you have trains. You have, you have trains. Yeah. You have animals. So it's you know we need something like that. Anyway, okay. Thank you, thank you, David. This I always love awesome. chatting with you. It's wonderful. Yes, it's wonderful. We'll talk more soon. Okay. Have a good night. Okay. Talk- Talk soon. Bye.